Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us once again. We've been studying the life in the last part of the life of Jesus. He is in the temple for the last time having a, an interchange with the leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees and the lawyers, and they are determined that they are going to trap him so that they can hold him up as a fraud to the people and have him killed. And they have come after one question after another, and Jesus has just shown them and defeated them every time. But they're a persistent lot. Yes. So they come with another question about which is the great commandment. Tell us about that. Well, and, and, and let's just, just one thing just in passing here is you, you, what you just mentioned. These questions they bring to Jesus were questions they had discussed again and again. They were arguing back and forth and back and forth and back. They had been arguing these things for years. And they thought these questions were unanswerable. Yeah. And Jesus just comes up with the perfect answer to the, the question just like it was nothing, no yeah. problem at all. Well, we come now to Matthew 22, and we're down to verse 34. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they came together, and one of them, a teacher of the law, tried to trap him with a question. They're still trying to trap him. Teacher, he asked, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Which commandment is that? Hmm? Number one. Number one? Well, not exactly. <laughs> no. This is Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. This is the greatest and most important commandment. The second most important commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Where did that come from? Leviticus. Leviticus 19, 18. So this is nothing new. I mean, these guys claim to have memorized the Old Testament. So they should have known all this, right? He puts these as equal. But in their society, they were not equal. They had decided that the uh, serve God was the far more important commandment. And so they spent all their time in the show with this, and they could do anything they wanted to their neighbor, and it was just, just fine. Yeah. Do well, you know, the, Do you know what the trap was for this particular question? Well... They, it was a question they argued about all the time, and so nobody Jesus... Nobody had come up with an answer. And nobody had a good answer. Okay. Were they, were they looking for, a, for a, a final decision on which of the Ten Commandments? Probably. Was, and in essence, what, you, what some would propose here is that is the first uh, thing that he mentioned that pertains to the first four of the commandments which are specifically related to humans and God mm -hmm. and then when he talks about being faithful to your fellow men that would be the last the last six is there, you, uh, Jesus, is there answer, a, yeah, Jesus answer yeah Jesus answer was a little bit like this. someone says would you like this or this and you say yes <laughs> <laughs> that's basically we, which is more important the first four commandments or the last six and Jesus says yes that's what's happened here okay also because it's, it is said if you disobey one of them, you've disobeyed them all. So had he said this one was better and that one was not, it would have created well, a sort of conundrum. The way, the way I, I like to look at that question is this. Here's Ten Commandments, let's say. Okay, suppose that uh, you're the one who decides who's going to get into heaven. Which, which commandment would you like to eliminate? It's fine to let murderers in? It's fine to let adulterers in. It's fine to let thieves, liars. Who do you want to let in? People who disrespect God? You know? You, 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 you can't. None of those things. Okay? 
Well, now it's Jesus' turn. By the way, if you're interested in the stuff we're talking about here, we have handouts that cover these things and talk about the sequence and so forth of, of these events that follow the story chronologically. They're found on our website, theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Uh, you'll find the handouts there. So Jesus questions now. When some Pharisees gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose descendant is he? Now, Jesus is going to raise a question. He is David's descendant, they answered. Why then, Jesus asked, did the Spirit inspire David to call him Lord? David said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my right side until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David called him Lord, how can the Messiah be David's descendant? And remember, in the Jewish society, the elders always took precedent over the younger. An older brother was obviously considered to be greater authority than a younger brother. That's why Jesus had trouble with his older half-brothers and sisters, as we sometimes call them. Uh, they all want to tell him what to do. So now what's going on here? He says, look, David, okay, who, the Messiah is David's son, okay? So who's, who's supposed to be respecting who? In that model, they would be respecting David. Yeah, m the Messiah would be respecting David. David. But in, in the text there, uh, which is in, 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 let's see, where is this found? Uh, 42, it's 44? 45. 45. Say it again. 45. Yeah. Psalms yeah. 110, one, I think. Psalms 110. Uh, verse 1. Well, I have 9, verse 7 in my footnote here. Anyway, it's in the Psalms for sure. So how do you explain that? 110, Psalms 110. That's what he said, yeah. We could go over there and have a look. Perhaps a better question would be, who would David be respecting? Yes. Well, that's really the question, isn't it? Yeah. Look at 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my right side until I put your enemies under your feet. There, there, there it's right there. And if you, if you know the Hebrew and the way we translated that in English, it's God said to my Lord, see, the Lord, that's Yahweh, said to my Lord, sit here at my right side until I put your enemies under your feet. So why is God respecting David, right? And then, well, anyway, the point is, how can David respect him if he's David's son? Well, he was first. Well, he was first. Jesus is first. Yeah. In the beginning was the Word. So once again, he's trying to say, now he's trying to say to the whole crowds what he had said to the Sanhedrin back in John 8, when he said, before Abraham was, I am. I am. I am. And I remember the story that I've probably mentioned on this telecast before about the, the black preacher in the South who was uh, telling the story about Jesus at age 12. And he said, you know, he, here he's at the temple and he's asking questions and Pretty soon they realize that he's asking better questions than they are. He understands the scripture better than they do. And one of these guys turns to Jesus and said, Son, how old are you? He said, Well, on my mother's side, I'm 12. <laughs> but on my father's side, I'm older than time. <laughs> that, that, I, I, I love that story. It's like just that. a great story. So what happens next? Well, well they, that was when they gave up asking questions. Yeah, and by, so the time, by the time they got done with that one, neither durst any man from that day yeah. forth ask him any more questions. Yeah. So now it's time for Jesus to speak up. Now he sets the agenda, right? And what does he look at? Look at verse, chapter 23. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees are the authorized interpreters of Moses' law. Okay? Jesus is saying they're supposed to have a legitimate function, right? They're the authorized interpreters of Moses' law. Now, in other words, they're supposed to get their authority from where? Moses. Well, from, from the scriptures, aren't they? Right. They're supposed to get their authority from the scriptures. Okay? So you must obey and follow everything they tell you to do. Do not, however, imitate 
their actions because they don't practice what they preach. Okay? So in other words, are they correctly bringing you the information from the Law of Moses, from the Bible? Well, when they're quoting it, yeah. They quote it correctly, but then by the time they're done interpreting, it might end up being tr just the opposite of what yeah. the Scripture says. Yeah. Okay? The message says it well. It says, you won't go wrong in following their teachings on Moses, but be careful about following them. Yes, exactly. They tie on to people's backs loads that are heavy and hard to carry, yet if they aren't willing even to lift a finger to help them carry their loads, those loads. They do everything so that people will see them. Look at the things, so that, um, look at the straps with scripture verses on them, which they wear on their foreheads and arms, and notice how large they are. Notice also how long are the tassels on their cloaks. And by the way, if you visit a Jewish synagogue or you go to the Western Wall, as they sometimes call it, the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, what will you find? Orthodox people wearing phylacteries. Yeah. There'll be Orthodox Jews there, and they will go through an elaborate process of putting on these phylacteries. And there they are, the pieces of scripture on their arms and on their forehead, little boxes that stick on their forehead like this. This is still a very, very definite I tradition. Saw, years ago, I saw one down on Fairfax Avenue in L.A. on a Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. <coughs> putting it on or wearing it? or Wearing it. Yeah. You're wearing it there on the... Uh, I have pictures of people wearing them at the, at the Western Wall in Jerusalem. Yeah. Enlarge the borders of their garments. Mm -hmm. uh, make the that, tassels that, long. That you said make the tassels long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. In other words, yeah. fancified. Yeah. They love the best places at feasts and they reserve, and the reserved seats in the synagogues. And by the way, do you know how the, what's the, what are the reserved seats in the synagogues? The synagogue was organized, there, there are seats around the, uh, in, the, in the back and around the sides, but then across the front there's a row of seats and right in the middle is one big main seat called the Seat of Moses. And the person who was in charge of the temple sat there and then if you were considered to be a real scholar or whatever, you would get one of these other reserved seats and you face the audience. Facing the audience, okay. You face the audience because you're the authorities, okay? That's the way that works. And by the way, you can still, I had the privilege of seeing one of those, what was left of, it was obviously broken down, one of those, temp, one of those synagogues on one of the Greek islands. Uh, really? A few summers ago, we were there with my son, and there was the, the seat of Moses was still there, partly broken down, and you could, the whole, and it said right there, synagogue of Jews. Hmm. Very interesting. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have people call them teacher, you must not be called teacher because you are all equal and have only one teacher. And who is the one teacher? Jesus, right? And you must not call anyone here on earth Father because you have only the one Father in heaven. Is What does that make you think of? Lots of Christians who have people they call fathers, right, that aren't their fathers. Yeah. Nor should you be called leader because you... Your one and only leader is the Messiah. The greatest one among you must be your servant. Whoever makes himself great will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be made great. And then Jesus starts in, and there's a whole litany. How terrible for you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Have, have you ever tried to picture, and I, whenever I read passages like this, I, I try to picture in my mind what's going on. So here are these people who've crowded in, presuming to be the experts with their long, fancy robes, their very expensive robes, raising these questions to try to trap Jesus. And now it's Jesus' turn, and so he's turning around, and here's this huge crowd, and here are the Pharisees, and what are they doing? <laughs> you know, they're probably running, running away, you know? You lock the door to the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. But you yourselves don't go in, nor do you allow in those who are trying to enter. What does that say? Uh, how do they go about that, locking the door? I mean, what is he what is Well, he he's saying, saying you make it virtually impossible for anyone to be saved. Yeah. You, you make it, well, uh, and I've said this before, and I mean, I don't need to say it again, but basically, 
To be a Pharisee, for example, you almost had to be independently wealthy. It was a full-time job just to practice your religion. <coughs> so, I mean, what, is a poor, what chance does a poor man have to be saved under those circumstances? Virtually none, right? How terrible for you, teachers, I'm reading now verse 15. How terrible for you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You hypocrites, you sail the seas and cross whole countries to win one convert. And when you succeed, you make him twice as deserving of going to hell as you yourselves are. What does that say to us? Wow. So he's saying that, and, and the, the experience of Paul later and with his Judaizers in, in his writings will come to is an illustration of this, right? They did everything possible to make people fit in their tight little, almost, almost straight jacket kind of positions, and you're not allowed to wiggle. You know? You've got to be circumcised. You've got to do this and this and this and this and this and 615 or however many rules it was for keeping the Sabbath. I mean, it was impossible. How can their converts be worse than they are? Well, because the converts felt like they had to outdo the teachers in order to prove they were good Jews. Mm. Yeah. Also because the, the convert did not do exactly what God commanded him to do, is to not follow their footsteps. And they were forewarned, and still they did not pay attention to God's say They just wanted yeah. to be like Mike. In verse 14, it says, Ye devour widows' houses. Mm -hmm. What's that about? Well, have them for lunch? <laughs> well, not quite. What, the, what it meant is, uh, an, an example is, if it, if it, we, when we passed over that passage before, but basically, if a child um, grew up and was, was, was became an adult, but in the household, here's his parents, he says, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, donate this. When I die, I'm going to give my property to the church. Suppose the person, that young person dies, which would happen fairly often in their day, before his parents, they, they would come along and they would say, oh, this property is now ours, out. And the parents would be left with no one to support them. Yeah, and a widow, you know, her husband is gone. What support she has? The only support she, support she has is the, the children. And so the, the children said, you know, we're giving this, this to the temple. If something happened to them, the widow's out high and dry. She had no choice. It's kind of a little bit like the banks these days foreclosing. Not mm -hmm. quite the same, but it's got that same flavor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, how terrible if you blind guides you teach. If someone swears by the temple, he isn't bound by his vow. But if he swears by the gold in the temple, he is bound. Blind fools. Which is more important, the gold or the temple which makes the gold holy? You also teach if someone swears by the altar, he isn't bound by his vow, but if he swears by the gift on the altar, he's bound. <clears throat> How blind you are, which is more important, the gift or the altar which makes the gift holy? So then when a person swears by the altar, he is swearing by it and by all the gifts on it. And when he swears by the temple, he is swearing by it and by God who lives there. And when someone swears by heaven, he is swearing by God's throne and by him who sits on it. In other words, what? Don't be, I mean, basically, remember their teaching was, well, Rabbi so-and-so said this, and Rabbi so-and-so says this, so we conclude this, and it's not quite what either one of those people says. They had split every rule in such fine parts that, you know, you could find a way around anything. And so that's what they were doing. That blending of ideas and coming up with something else, mm -hmm. what's the modern... Uh, <laughs> equivalent? equivalent of that. Well, there's a lot of religions who do that. Um, mixing ideas from the world with their religion. Many, many, many do that. The, it, it, there's a word called syncretism. Right. Would that, would that yeah. be appropriate there? That's, that's exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. Well, I don't know that we need to read all this, but he just goes on and just nails them again and again and again. And here it's in their territory, what they consider to be their territory, in the temple, and he's p pointing out all their faults right there while they're present, and you know, hundreds, I'm sure, maybe thousands of people are listening to them in the temple. What would you do if you were a scribe and Phar or a Pharisee at that point? 
Wish you were someplace else. <laughs> Wish you were someplace else. <laughs> I suspect the hair on the back of your neck would raise. You might get flushed in the face. But really, when you're swearing on God's name, you're using his name in vain. I mean, they're breaking yeah. the commandments right exactly. there. It's blasphemous. <coughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. He himself, if I'm not mistaken, in the, I believe it's in the Old Testament, he says, do not swear upon him because he doesn't want anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. He knows human beings are not good at, at keeping their words, so. Or by heaven. Mm -hmm. Right, or by heaven or anything in it, yes. on your head. I like the bit where he says you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. That about yeah. sums yeah. it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, finally, Jesus comes down to verse uh, 37. Actually, before we get there, turn over to um, Mark 12 verse 41. We're, gonna, we're trying to go through things here uh, chronologically. Mark 12, verse 41. As Jesus sat near the temple treasury, he's in the temple now, and where would you suppose, now remember there's a, there's a huge court where Jesus has been doing most of his teaching for Gentiles. And then there's a smaller court that's for Jewish women. And then there's an inside court just for Jewish men. And then, of course, way inside is, is the area for just, just for priests. So where do you suppose the, uh, the uh, Sadducees who were in charge of the temple would, would keep the offering plates? The offering. There were big containers for people to put money in. Where would they put them? Where there's access by all. By all whom? Everybody could see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Where everybody could hear. Anybody coming and going. And anyone could put money in. Okay, but you wouldn't want it to be out there in the marketplace where everybody might be able to come along and steal it. So these baskets are put in the court of with the women. Because they wanted all the Jews to have access. They figured no Gentile is going to come put money in it anyway. So it's inside the, the door where the women are allowed to go, where the women and the men, men have to go through there on their way to their place. So that's where, they, that's where these offering places were kept. High traffic. High traffic. <laughs> as Jesus sat near the temple treasure, he watched the people as they dropped in their money. Many rich people dropped in a lot of money. Then a poor widow came along and dropped into two little copper coins, worth about a penny. Okay, you could buy what with a penny? Two sparrows. Right? He called his disciples together and said to them, I tell you that this poor widow put more in the offering box than all the others. For the others put in what they had to spare of the riches. But she, poor as she is, put in all she had. She gave all she had to live on. What are we supposed to learn from that story? She must have had faith for one thing, because mm -hmm. if you throw your money in and you have no money to live on after mm -hmm. that, she must be dependent on God. Do you think God took care of her? Well, she knows it, she, he does, or she wouldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. She was genuine, they were faking. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by took care of her? Um, I'm sure after the rich folks put their big amounts in, and she put her little amounts in, they still ended up with a whole lot more than she had, and she probably ended up giving, believe it or not, despite everything we read about the scribes and the Pharisees, giving something to the poor was one of the three cardinal things that you were supposed to do as a Jew. So presumably, this widow would be able to go out and people would give her something. What, what, what lessons are we supposed to learn from her? <laughs> Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Yeah. Was she throwing her heart in the... Well, you know, I... <laughs> I exactly right. She That's exactly what she was doing. Yeah. She, she put everything she had into that and was totally dependent on God. She knew it, he knew it, okay. and they were happy. Her offering was genuine. She wasn't there to be seen. Okay. Yes, exactly. She was trying not to be seen. Yeah. But now, I want, I want to tell you, I want to ask you about a part of the story which we usually don't mention. What happened to that money? It 
it was used in all the corrupt practices that everything else it, was. It was, was divided up in the den of thieves, right? right? Mm -hmm. Divided up in the den of thieves. And what do you suppose Caiaphas would do when he came to those two little copper coins? Cost no, them. <laughs> I mean, they were hardly worth his time to even bother with them, right? Now, what does that teach us? Well, if you got a corrupt preacher, don't put money in the offering. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 hold on. True. So, if you're going to say that, you're saying Jesus is wrong. Well, but you just said our money went for nothing. Okay, but so what's the message we're supposed to get here? Even Jesus, if, even if there is a corrupt preacher, you're supposed to give the money anyway. Even if you don't, even if you're not happy with something the church might be doing, whether it's your local church or even at the general conference level, if you're not happy with it, that does not remove your responsibility to give. Because God blesses you based on your willingness to give, not on the basis of something that might be happening further down the line somewhere. Now, there are other ways to deal with that. I mean, we're supposed to have a democratic society. We're supposed to do. If there's something wrong in the church, well, then we ought to gather together and try to fix it. But that is never an excuse. I mean, if there was anyone who had an excuse for not giving those two copper coins, it would be that woman. If she knew who was on the other side, which she must have known, who was on the other side what was going to happen with those coins, she should never have given those two coins. Ellen White talks about her love for the temple and her love for, the, for that, that it was honest and true, and she wanted nothing more than to give to the cause that she loved. Yeah, yeah. Not thinking about Caiaphas. No, uh, she wasn't worried about him. <laughs> Very important, okay? I think that's a really important lesson that we need to, to keep in mind when we... Uh, read this. Well, we're about out of time for the first half of our lesson. We need to turn now over to John verse chapter 12. John chapter 12. And we're going to start with verse 20. Now, we, we've suggested that this is Jesus' last day in the temple. Last day in the temple. And something very interesting happens. Some Greeks were among those who had gone to Jerusalem to worship during the festival. Now, who do you suppose these were? Would these, would these be Greek, just pure Greeks, or would they be Greek Jews, Greek-speaking Jews? Greek-speaking Jews. Probably Greek-speaking Jews. They went to Philip, he was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and the two of them went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has now come for the Son of Man to receive great glory. Why would he say that? I'm telling you the truth, a grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain until, unless it is dropped into the ground and dies. If it does die, then it produces many grains. Those who love their own life will lose it. Those who hate their own life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever wants to serve me must follow me so that my uh, servant will be with me where I am, and my Father will honor one, anyone who serves me. What in the world is he talking about here? Greeks come from the West, and he launches into a story about wheat falling into the ground. Well, fortunately, we're going to take a break right now. Don't go away, because we'll talk about it when we come back.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. Remember, Jesus is, gets all excited because some Greeks have come from where? Presumably from out in the west. west, out west somewhere. And they're coming to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Okay. By the way, this is interesting because in the Greek, the Greek here is Thelemon Blepain Yesu. This may have been the only time in Jesus' ministry, or maybe in his whole life, where he was actually called Jesus. Because what would be his Aramaic name? Joshua. Yeshua. Yeshua. Joshua. We would, we would put that in, in. So he was Joshua the Mas Mashiach, the Joshua the Messiah. He was never called Jesus Christ. That's, uh, that's English. And, and the English comes from the, the English come from, our, our English comes from the Greek. Um, and so these Greeks were coming to speak. But there's something ve else very interesting about this. Who came to greet Jesus when he arrived at the beginning as a baby? Wise men. From where? The east. From the east. east. From the east. Yeah. Far in the east. Who came to greet Jesus as he's coming, his life is coming to an end? West. Yeah. Wise men from the west. Hmm. From the east to the west. Yes. Very so interesting. So shall be the coming of the Son, Son of, of man. man. Okay. And so what is Jesus going to say about this? Now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, do not let this hour come upon me? So what's he thinking about? He's thinking about the crucifixion, which is coming up in a couple days. Is he talking to the Greeks while he's saying this? Well, listen and see what you think. We're gonna, let me read a couple more verses, and then we'll answer, ask your question. But that is why he, he's specifically speaking to the Father right now. But that is why I came, so that I might go through this hour of suffering. Father, bring glory to your name. Now, what does that have to do with the Greeks coming from the West? Sun rises from the East and sets in the West. <laughs> okay, which is fine, but what else does that say? Coming Jesus is saying, yeah, we're coming to the, I'm coming to the end of my life, and my message is, to, is come, uh, travel all the way from the East to the West. In other words, the message I'm coming here to give you is supposed to be for whom? The entire world, right? It's part of the message he was giving. Then a voice spoke from heaven. I have brought glory to it, and I will do so again. The crowd standing there heard the voice, and some of them said it was thunder, while others said an angel spoke to him. Now, think about the context. We've been reading the stories here in chronological order. Jesus is in the temple. There are literally thousands of people gathering around, and here some, some Greeks managed to squeeze in. They, we want to see Jesus. And boom, this voice sounds. What do you suppose they thought? They? Who? The people, thousands of people who are gathered About around. About time for a king. Well, they, that's what they would have liked to do. But Jesus said to them, notice carefully, it was not for your sake, I'm sorry, it was not for my sake that this voice spoke, but for yours. Now is the time for this world to be judged. Now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. Who's he talking about? Satan. Satan. The devil. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. In saying this, he indicated the kind of death he was going to suffer. Did they understand that then? I mean, think? would they have understood that language, if I be lifted up? Would, they, yeah. would that mean crucifixion to them in the vernacular? I don't think so. Mm. Nicodemus understood it back in John 3. Mm. Same language. But I don't think the disciples, the people who were listening, I doubt that they had any idea until he, after it happened. He even told them he was going to be crucified and they didn't sure. really hear it or understand it. But wasn't the snake out there in the desert, wasn't it lifted up? Yeah. Yeah. It, it is the same kind of language? Yeah. That, of course, was Hebrew. Well, now we're, yeah. we're but the, written. Okay, but the, the idea. idea. Yeah. It was lifted up from the earth, mm -hmm. from the dirt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By the way, what did Jesus say? I will draw all, all men. No, leave the men out. The, the, the all men were, the word <laughs> men is supplied in some versions. It's not there in the original. Good. Okay. 
<laughs> Ellen White has some very interesting things to say about that. Do you know what she said? She goes on to say, the crucifixion of Jesus was not primarily even for this earth, it was for the entire universe. It's the entire universe that Jesus is speaking to here. Not just men, women, and children on this earth, all those are included, but for the entire universe. Okay? All beings. So the crowd answered, Our law tells us that the Messiah will live forever. How then can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus is trying to make it very clear that He's the Messiah, and they're trying to say, You're the wrong kind of Messiah. We know what kind of Messiah we want. That would indicate they understood something about lifted up. Yeah. Yes. Well, they wouldn't have been yeah. arguing against it. Jesus answered, the light will be uh, among you a little longer. Continue on your way while you have the light so that the darkness will not come upon you. So, for the one who walks in the dark does not know where he's going. Believe in the light, then you will have it so that you will be the light. Of the, you will be the people of the light. So, we go on. After Jesus said this, he went off and hid himself from them. Even though he had performed all these miracles in their presence, they did not believe in him, so that what the prophet Isaiah had said might come true. Now, I mean, here's the situation. Jesus has been with them for the last time. Matthew's comment is what? He went away. Nobody had any, any more to say. Here's, here's John's comment. Lord, who believed the message we told? To whom did the Lord reveal his power? And that's straight out of Isaiah 53. So, so John says, not only has he gone away, he, this is a fulfillment of prophecy, right? And so they were not able to believe because Isaiah also said, God has blinded their eyes and closed their minds that their eyes would not see and their minds would not understand and they would not turn to me, says God, for me to heal them. Isaiah said this, said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Even then, many Jewish authorities believed in Jesus, but because of the Pharisees, they did not talk about it openly so as not to be expelled from the synagogue. They loved human approval rather than the approval of God. It's very interesting that Matthew talks about this. Matthew's Gospel, of course, was written a long time later. He talks about this back in his first chapter. Do you remember what he said about what happens? Look at John. Did I say Matthew? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, John. We're, we're reading from John. John said in chapter 1 and uh, verse 11, he came to his own country. Literally, it's he came to his own home, but his own people did not receive him. He came to his home, and his own people did not receive him. Well, they have finally, finally rejected Jesus. Let's read the last few words from Jesus. Jesus said in a loud voice, Whoever believes in me believes not only in me, but also in him who sent me. Whoever sees me sees also him who sent me. What's he saying there? I and the Father are what? One. One. So when you see me, what are you seeing? The Father. You're seeing the Father. When you see what I do, if the Father were here, what would he be doing? Same thing. Same thing. I have come into the world as light so that everyone who believes in me should not remain in the darkness. If people hear my message and do not obey it, I will not judge them. I came not to judge the world, but to save it. Save it is another word, word for healing, to, to heal it. The message who reject, I'm sorry, those who reject me and do not accept my message have one who will judge them. The words I have spoken will be their judge on the last day. This is true because I have not spoken of my own authority, but the Father who sent me has commanded me what I must say and speak, and I know that his command brings eternal life. What I say then is what the Father has told me to say. When did he say your house is left unto you desolate? When did he say that? Yeah. That was right at this point in time as he's leaving the temple. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, the, the story, the next part of the story is Matthew 24. Turn over to Matthew 24. What happens? Do you remember? Just 
disciples ask when will this happen? Verse 50 of uh, ch chapter 12, I know that his commandment is eternal life. Mm -hmm. Remember in, in John 17, eternal life is to know the Father and the Son, but his commandment here says eternal mm -hmm. life. Yeah. So look at Matthew 24, Jesus left and was going away from the temple when his disciples came to him to call his attention to its buildings. Now, Jesus is leaving the temple. He's traveling down to the Kidron Valley and up the other side of the Mount of Olives. And as he's traveling across there, he looks back and as the sun is setting, and here's this beautiful white marble with gold shining on it and so forth like this. And the disciples say, you know, how, Jesus, how can you say all those awful things against our temple? This glorious, beautiful temple that you see here. How could you possibly say those things? And what, what was Jesus' response? When his disciples came to him to call his attention to his buildings, yes, he said, you may, may well look at all these. I tell you this, not a single stone here will be left in his place. Every one of them will be thrown down. That, that, that must have been really, really hard to <coughs> even begin to comprehend. It's almost, it's unfathomable because you know, if someone attacked, generally they would not destroy the, the buildings. For many reasons, they would not. And, you know, it reminds me of the prophecy of Tyre. That's an impossible prophecy, impossible. Yet, it came true, and we know it's true today. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of dashes your hopes for him becoming king if he's saying that the most significant uh, structure in his kingdom is going to be destroyed. Yeah. Usually that indicates that there's been some kind of an invading army. Yeah. That's going to be tearing things all apart. So well, what does Jesus say? Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. Now he's sitting on the Mount of Olives. It's Tuesday evening of the week before Passover. He's got two more days until the, 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 the Lord's Supper in, in the upper room. Um, Tell us when all this will be, they said to him. Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him in private. Tell us when all this will be, they asked, and what will happen to show that it is a time for your coming and the end of the age. A time for your coming, and what are they thinking of? Your kingdom. You're going to be Here's the kingdom. When are you going to do it? <laughs> yeah, when are you going to do it? Jesus answered, watch out, and do not let anyone fool you. Many men claiming to speak for me will come and say, I am the Messiah. And they will fool many people. Now, if the real Messiah is here, how many other fakes are going to be able to get by with saying they're the Messiah? Not many. Not many. Well, you are going to hear the noise of battles close by and the news of battles far away, but do not be troubled. Such things must happen, but they do not mean that the end has come. Countries will fight each other. Kingdoms will attack each other. There will be famines and earthquakes everywhere. All these things are like the first pains of childbirth. In other words, the glorious coming of my kingdom is not going to be tomorrow or the next day. It's going to be a long time, right? Then you will be arrested and handed over to be punished and be put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. Many will give up their faith at that time. They will betray one another and hate one another. Then many false prophets will appear and fool many people. Such will be the spread of evil that many people's love will grow old. But whoever holds out to the end will be saved. And this good news about the kingdom, and they think, what's the good news about the kingdom? He's going to be king. Jesus is going to be king real, real quick now, right? This news about the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world for a witness to all people, and then the end will come, right? You will see the awful horror. They weren't looking for an end, they were looking for a beginning. Yeah. You will see the awful horror of which the prophet Daniel spoke. It will be standing in the holy place. Now, this is a very significant verse for a lot of reasons. Why is it very, very important? When, if they were expecting the Messiah to come and set up an eternal kingdom mm -hmm. here on earth, mm -hmm. 
And what did they do with prophecies like this from Daniel and about the end of things? And so well, because this, I mean, this is the, you know, this here is in Matthew, but the Old Testament is filled with all kinds of things like that. So what did they, if they thought the Messiah was going to come and... Well, the, the one who, the, the clearest prophetic messages, long-term prophetic messages are in the book of Daniel. And we know that what has happened to the book of Daniel, it has been attacked and attacked and attacked. And in general, our Christian friends believe what about the book of Daniel? That it's history. That it was written somewhere around 165 and all of the stuff about nations and everything in there, that's all history. By the time we're looking at the book of, you know, by the time the book of Daniel is written, all that stuff is history. There's no real prophecy in there at all. Are you saying 165 after Christ? B.C., before BC. Christ. Uh, yeah, but my question is not, not, not since Jesus spoke these words, mm -hmm. but as he was speaking these things, mm -hmm. it was the, th the fundamental theology of, of, of the Jewish people that the Messiah would come, and he's going to set up an everlasting kingdom here, and it's going to go on forever and ever. So what do they do with these destruction passages that yeah. say things are going to come to an end? Yeah. Did they discredit See, Daniel as well? But their idea was that Jesus would come one time, he would set up his kingdom, and that would be it. But, I mean, but my yeah. question is, what do they yeah. do with all these? Well, this is, this is all happening. This is all new to them. This is all brand new. At the end of Christ's life, he's now talking. And we, we know that Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21, where these things are talked about, this is brand new stuff to them. What would they have interpreted as the abomination of desolation? Well, let's, let's, let's talk about that for a moment. Whatever it is, let me make an important point first of all. Jesus says, what about that? What does he say about it? When you see it in the holy place. It will be standing in the holy place. Will be. When's that? Future tense. And... So the people who would say that Daniel is all Old Testament, I mean, is all history by 165 B.C., Jesus contradicts them. Yes, he does. He says the pro at least part of the fulfillment of the book of Daniel is still future. Yeah, yeah it's a mixture. And, and we know that Daniel is at least partially prophetic because Daniel specifically asked a question, mm -hmm. and he received the answer, and that answer is the prophetic part about when when would all these things happen? And you have to ignore the very, the very reading of the, of the prophecies of Daniel that in themselves if you're going to cut it off in 165 B.C. because those prophecies, several of them, end up with what? With Christ coming at the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that has to be yet future. He hasn't come yet the second time. Mm-hmm. So note to the reader, understand what this means. Jesus says, I know what kind of corruption is going to come with interpreting scriptures in the future. So, But well, the, the next verse is, when you see that, mm -hmm. then head for the mountains. Yeah. <laughs> so what kind of a sign would they be thinking of when they should flee to the mountains? Well, when they That would mean leave Jerusalem. Yeah. When they see Jerusalem being attacked and ready to be destroyed. So this, this abomination of desolation would be an army? Mm -hmm. And where is the holy place? In the temple. I heard one uh, interpretation that, that they had kind of cleaned an area out around Jerusalem where they didn't want, the, where they didn't want uh, commerce to be done on Sabbath, and that that was referred to as the holy place. And that when an army comes standing and surrounding Jerusalem, yeah. get ready to leave. Yeah. Well, and historically, the Christians took this verse very seriously, these verses very seriously. Yeah. And we know that in A.D. 66, the Roman army came down, surrounded Jerusalem, and then all of a sudden, for reasons that nobody has an explanation for, they disappeared. So that army never got into the temple holy place. So the sign that they saw couldn't have been that one. No. But what they saw was enough to say, here's our chance, let's get out of here. The Christians left. Yeah. And they moved across the Jordan. 
the headquarters for the Christian Church moved across the Jordan River into Perea. Into Perea. Yeah. yeah. But wasn't it that Titus' father got called back to Rome and left Titus there? If you read the history of it, that's what they say. I know yeah. what it says here, but that's the reason given. Mm -hmm. And then when his father got that sorted out, he handed it over to Titus. Mm -hmm. They resupplied and came back with a vengeance. Yeah. And four years later, AD 70, yeah. After sieging for, well, I don't know how long, well, a year and a half or something like this, they flattened the city, destroyed it completely, and but killed up. Basically, we've got two things going here, the destruction after Christ left mm -hmm. and then the final end of history. Well, he goes on there, and we don't need to read through all this um, about all the awful things that are going to happen. Drop down to verse 23. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear. They will perform great miracles and wonders in order to deceive even God's chosen people if possible. Listen, I have told you this ahead of time. Does this remind you of any other part of the Bible? I always think of something else when I, when, when I read this. I know people who, for curiosity's sake, like to go see... Uh, religious phenomena and this kind of thing. I, is this a, a, uh, a message that says, if you go out there in the last days where these miracles are being performed, if you put yourself in that environment, you will be deceived? Probably. The, the, the passage of scripture that I think fits perfectly well with this is, the, is Revelation 13. And if you read there, I'm just going to read three or four verses. I'm going to read verse 3, verse 4, and then verses 7 and 8. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded, but the wound had healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. Everyone worshipped the dragon. Who's the dragon here in Revelation 13? The devil. The devil. Worshipped the devil because he had given his authority to the beast. They worshipped the beast also, saying, Who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? And dropping down to verse 7, it was allowed to fight against God's people and to defeat them. And it was given authority over every tribe, nation, language, and race. All people living on earth will worship it except, and now, that's the words we had back here. The very elect. The very elect, you see. Except those whose names are written before the creation of the world in the book of the living, which belongs to the Lamb that was killed. That's a sobering situation. Very sobering situation. Here we are, Jesus giving the, the, the prophecy. Um, listen, I have told you this ahead of time. Or if people should tell you, look, he is out in the desert, don't go there. Or if they look, he's hiding here, don't believe it. For the Son of Man will come like the lightning which flashes across the whole sky from the east to the west. Wherever there is a dead body, the vultures will gather. What in the world is that saying? When the Lord comes, the saints go with him, mm -hmm. the wicked are killed, they're not buried because there's nobody to bury them, mm -hmm. and here come the vultures. Here come the vultures, okay. Anyone mm -hmm. else have another suggestion? Norm spent a bunch of time in East Africa with us. He should know about this kind of experience. When you go out to the big game parks like the Serengeti or the Maasai Mara or any one of a number of parks out there, and you're looking. Now, things have changed since we have cell phones and all that kind of stuff. If you go out with a game guard now, if he finds something, he's on his phone instantly to all the other people, and they're all, oh, yeah, come over here. There's lions over here. There's leopards over here. There's cheetahs here, whatever. But in the old days, what did you have to do? Check the vultures. You looked out there, if you see a bunch of vultures circling somewhere, you know that... Probably a kill down below. There's a kill. There's a dead body down below. So what does that have to do with what Jesus is saying here? Got a lot of victims coming up. Well, that he says, and, and what he's saying is when you see a lot of people gathering around, you can what's be going on down sure there? God is not in that part. There's a dead body down there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, don't go rushing out for every story, every rumor. Every time you see a bunch of vultures gathering, don't rush over there to see what's going on, right? It's a dead body. 
it's a dead body. But it, 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 it's given as though if you go, you'll be a dead body. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another part. Well, and, and if, if you're fooled by all these people, you will be. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's not quite easy, though, because um, after Jesus had risen, he told a disciple to meet him somewhere mm -hmm. at some area. Mm -hmm. And um, so that kind of fulfills it, too, but it didn't work out that way. It's, it's a different situation. And, and for three years, everybody's, wherever Jesus showed up doing all of this, these miracles and so forth, people gathered. Mm -hmm. But he yeah. had told them that he would meet them out there before his death. Mm -hmm way before his death. And we, we will not be deceived because he's already told us. We hope not. So we're not going to go out to meet anyone who's claiming to be the Christ because Jesus told us that we're going to see him come in the sky as lightning flashes from east to west. The angel who rolled away the stone said, why are you looking? I, I mean, after, I'm sorry, after the, uh, uh, we're running out of time, but uh, you know, after he ascended back to heaven, the angel said he will come in the same way. So we will not be deceived. Well, when you say we, hopefully the righteous, well, the righteous will not be deceived because they have all these warnings and they pay attention to the warnings. But we've already seen, he said, the, the devil will deceive all but the very elect. And Revelation said only a remnant will be saved. So this is a, this is a fearsome warning. Jesus is, is saying these words, he's saying, Pay attention, folks. Please, please, please pay attention. So now, what have we seen in these last, um, what, two days or so forth of the life of Christ so forth? Next time we'll, we'll pick up what happened with the, with the Last Supper and so forth. But here we see Jesus once again telling his disciples, don't follow the guidance of the scribes and Pharisees. Don't listen. Listen to them when they read, read to you out of, out of the Bible, out of what we would call the Bible. But don't listen to their interpretations because they're going to mislead you. And fearsome times are coming up. And this, this coming is not the coming of the Messiah you're looking forward to. That's going to be quite a long time yet. And there's a lot of terrible things that are going to have to happen before that can take place. See you next week.